So how do I pray? You know, that's the most frequent question I get asked. How, how do I pray? How do I know I'm praying right? What's prayer all about? Prayer is, is that most personal experience we get with God. And, and yet it's, uh, it's also mysterious. It's, it's dis difficult to grasp. And I don't know about you, but I've often wondered, am I praying right? Right? I, I've asked that question. I mean, why pray in some ways, right? Is, is it, 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 do I pray to get something from God? Do I pray so that I gain peace in my heart? Is prayer more than just meditation? And just sitting there and being silent. Does, does prayer have to be in a certain posture? You know, do I have to prostrate myself on the ground? Do I have to be on my knees? Do my hands have to be folded? You know, we taught our kids to, to pray around the kitchen table, you know, for, for, for dinner. But we had them fold their hands so they kept them to themselves, you know, <laughs> kind of a thing. But we, but we wonder, how do I pray? What is it? And, and, and what about that little tagline on the end? In Jesus' name. Is that some magic phrase that I gotta put on there? What is it? Please tell me that prayer is more than just saying some right phrases and some right words and tagging on <laughs> in Jesus' name. Please tell me it's more than. So we're in this series called Radical because normal isn't working. And so often we've messed up this thing called prayer. Our normal way of approaching prayer has left us more empty than the scripture seems to indicate that it should be filling us. And we leave more frustrated, wondering about this God who calls us to commune with him. I've wrestled with prayer, I think, for my entire life, my entire Christian life, since I was 15. I I've approached prayer uh, when I needed to get better grades. <laughs> and God was probably up there saying, study. <laughs> and I thought I could pray my way to them. Uh, I I've used prayer as a way to bargain with God. No show of hands if you've done the same. I've bargained with God through prayer. If you'll do this, God, then I'll do that. There have been times when I didn't know how to pray. No words. There have been times when I remember a season in my life when every morning, two hours, each morning for this long season of time, I would spend time with God and, and in his word and with a little journal to, to, to hear what God was saying and, and spending time just listening for God's voice. It's an incredible season of prayer. And then I've had seasons of prayer. Well, seasons of no prayer. Seasons where I didn't spend any time alone with it seemed like my only connection with God was on the run, you know? It was while I was doing other things. I wrestled with prayer, I feel like, my whole life. And, and there's something, there's some kind of fear about this prayer thing, I think. We're, we're afraid we might get this kind of response from God. Dear Mr. or Mrs. Smith. I'm writing in response to this morning's request for forgiveness. I'm sorry to inform you that you've reached your quota of sins. Our records show that since employing our services, you have erred seven times in the area of greed, and your prayer life is substandard when compared to others of like age and circumstance. Further review reveals that your understanding of doctrine is in the lower 20th percentile, and you have excessive tendencies to gossip. Because of your sins, you are a high-risk candidate for heaven. You understand that grace does have its limits, don't you? 
Jesus sends his regrets and kindest regards and hopes he will find some other form of coverage. I mean, now, now if we're really honest, maybe I'm the only one, but if we're really honest, there's a part of us that's like a little afraid that's how God might think of us. Because we know us. And we wonder how God will react. Our thoughts about God are usually way more limiting than who God really is. The closest followers of Jesus asked him one time, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, if I could ask Jesus anything, I mean, why did they ask that question? He preached great sermons. He healed all kinds of diseases. He raised the dead. But the disciples asked him, teach us to pray. There's something significant to that. Prayer is dangerous work. Prayer changes people. Often it mostly changes the prayer, I think. Prayer changes circumstances as well. Methodist founder John Wesley said, God will do nothing except in answer to prayer. He was a prayer warrior. Wesley believed that the hand of God did not move unless those called by his name would pray. But there are those nagging questions. Am I doing it right? Am I, am I saying it right? Am I in the right way? So let's try to clear up some misconceptions and then look at what prayer is. You've got some notes in your bulletin, and let me encourage you to grab those as we look at this grandest of topics and in some ways the most important means of grace that God has for our lives just as we've shared this communion means of grace so prayer is a grand means of how God brings grace into our lives here's four misconceptions four big misconceptions I think first of all that prayer is like a magic wand some people think prayer is this magic wand. You kind of wave it over something. It's, it, it's, it's that superstitious approach. Sort of, you get what you want if you say the right words. And by the way, you tag on the in Jesus' name. Because the Bible says you're supposed to pray in Jesus' name, right? God is kind of like a little genie. You rub his belly the right way and you get what you ask for. Some people conceive of prayer that way. The second is a first aid kit. Prayer is a first aid kit. It's an act of desperation. It's the sign for the fire extinguisher. Use only in emergencies. And we go to God only when we're on our last leg. For a lot of people, prayer is like that. It's a last resort. When things are falling apart, then we pray. Sort of like you've heard the phrase, you've probably used it. I know I've used it. I guess all we can do is pray. <clears throat> Has it really come to that? <laughs> we might ask, well, yes. Prayer, if prayer is the last thing, if it's only an emergency, if it's only a first aid, will think of prayer very differently than God does. Here's a third misconception is bargain hunting. Bargain hunting. Some approach prayer as a, a great hunting trick. Uh, they, they, they tell God that they'll do certain things in return for God doing other things. And it's, it's usually that we'll stop doing some things in return for God answering our prayers. Right? But that's not prayer. Here's the fourth big one. And it's prayer as a religious duty. Simply as a duty. It might be the most crippling of misconceptions of prayer. For many people, prayer is just that religious thing that you're supposed to do. The basic motivation behind it is guilt. If I don't do it, then I know I should pray more. I, I know I ought to pray more. I, I, I know God wants me to pray more. It becomes a duty, a sense of obligation. And 
Because if we don't pray, we might get on God's bad list. Prayer becomes memorized lists and phrases instead of a conversation. So what is prayer? What is prayer? And it really is that first thing. The first thing is it's communication. It's conversation with God. It's, it's speaking to God and it's listening to God. It's communication. I mean, think, think about our own human lives. Most of our problems are around communication, right? Communication with your wife, your husband, your customers, your kids. Most of our problems in life come from poor communication. You can't understand a person in marriage unless you communicate with them. You can't understand God and God's will for your life unless you communicate with him. Here's what Jesus said in John 15. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. There's that little phrase again. I don't know about you, but I think we probably seldom pray, really, when we think about it. And part of the reason is I think we fail to recognize how desperately God wants to communicate with if I told you tomorrow that I had arranged a meeting for you with the President of the United States, you had 20 minutes to interview him, what would the next 24 hours be like for you? I don't know. You might not sleep. You might get a haircut. You might get a new outfit. You might, you know, any number of things. You might write out some questions, right? You might write out some things and, and, and say, this is what I want. I don't want to forget something, and I don't want to say something I shouldn't say. You'd really prepare for that, wouldn't you? We have a greater invitation than that. Talk with the creator of the universe. You and I are invited to go to the top of the ladder. Prayer is talking to God as a friend. One who wants to reveal everything about us to us. His plans for our lives. His purpose in us. God cares deeply about every detail of our lives. Sometimes I'm not sure we grasp that. I know I don't. I think if we really believed that God cared about every little detail, we'd pray more. See, you see God, God is interested in car payments and house payments. He's interested in, in, can you buy new clothes for the kids for school? And what about that guy at work who irritates you? The fact that you have back problems or anything else that's going on in your life. God cares deeply about every single one of those things. Everything. When we understand how much God loves us, prayer becomes communication. becomes a relationship becomes a conversation. Here's the second thing I think prayer is that really helps me, is prayer is supplication. That's a little bit of a churchy word, uh, but it's, it's supplication. Here's where it comes from in Philippians 4, 6. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, with your prayers and your supplications, make your requests known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus result of your asking, your requests and prayers will be peace of mind. Here's a place where God is pressing me a bit lately in prayer. I, I've, I've noticed it by listening to other people pray, and I've noticed myself tending to this place. And it's when we're praying for and I won't say it's a great need because all needs are important to God, but there's those needs, you know, of, of intense or physical healing. Those 
really deep needs. And, and what I've taught myself to do is praying for God to move in somebody's life because of how wonderful that person is. And what God's been nudging me on is, Jeff, I don't move because of the goodness of human beings. I move because of my goodness and my mercy. <gasps> and, I, and I just, I'm like, oh, yeah. Uh, you know, I know that in my head. But my heart wants to say, but oh God, there's such a wonderful person, please do such and such. God says, that's not why I move. So, prayer for me is becoming, I've noticed where I slipped from focusing on God as the, as the center of the prayer. And I've made too often people the center of the prayer. God is. God's the focus. God's. Here's what Jesus says in John 16. I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. I tell you the truth, the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. The fact of the matter is prayer is God's chosen method of meeting our needs. The Bible teaches that there are some things that God has promised to do only if we pray. Some people think, well, God knows what I need, so why should I ask? Or, or, or sometimes we, we, we say, well, why pray? Because isn't it all determined already anyways? God has set up in his plan that he wants to hear from us. He wants to know what's in our hearts. I mean, he already knows what's in our heart, but I don't know about you, but there's something when I say it out loud that, that sort of makes me own it. Sort of makes me grab it. James chapter 4, verse 2. You do not have because you do not ask God. Oh, how often I've come back to that verse. Ask God for direction, for help, for guidance, and he will give it when we don't need to watch out. Things are all, aren't always as they seem. Ask God. Ask God. There's this interesting story out of the book of Joshua about a time when so Israelites didn't pray. They didn't ask for God's guidance. Listen to what happened. We are your servants, they said to Joshua. But Joshua asked, where are, who are you and where do you come from? And they answered, your servants have come from a very distant country because of the fame of the Lord your God. For we have heard reports of him, all that he did in Egypt, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, Sihon, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who reigned in Ashtaroth. And our elders and all those living in our country said to us, Take provisions for your journey. Go and meet them and say to them, We are your servants. Make a treaty with us. This bread of ours was warm when we packed it at home on the day we left to come to you. But now, it, it, now see how dry and moldy it is. And these wineskins that were filled with new wine, but, but see how, how cracked they are. And our clothes and sandals are worn out by the very long journey. The men of Israel sampled their possession, provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. It's one of those stories where they ended up making a, a, a treaty with the native people that they were supposed to get rid of. <laughs> uh, and, and, and God honored that treaty, but God said... You know, if you just would have asked, if you would have inquired of me, we, we, we dare not go about life by our own instincts, 
by what we see in front of our eyes and say, this must be right. God's word says, inquire, ask, 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 and I'll give you the answer. What are you lacking right now in your life? What do you need in your life right now? What kind of wisdom do you need? What kind of grace do you need? What kind of help? You could ask God to move in your life in, in, a, in a particular way. What would it be? Have you asked specifically? That's another great challenge of radical prayer is sometimes we don't ask in the of God. God, please bless so and so. And God's up there, I think, most of the time going, I already am. What do you want me to do? We don't have to ask God to bless somebody. God, that's, that's the heart of God. What do you need God to do? Sometimes our prayers aren't radical enough because we're not bold enough. What do you need God to do? God, I need an answer to this in the next 24 hours. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that gets pretty specific, right? Does that scare you? Is that fearful? Where's, where's faith? All of those questions. Psalm 145. He will fulfill the desires of those who reverence him. Those who honor God says. I love Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. As a young and mature Christian, I read that verse and I thought, oh, I got a lot of desires in my heart, and if I just delight in God, I get them all. But when you delight yourself in God, he changes the desires of your heart to be his desires. That's the heart of God. Psalm 84. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. See, God is not up there holding all these things back saying, you've got to convince me to give them to you. God wants to give them to us. This is the God we pray to. And then back in Luke 11, remember Luke 11, 1 was when the disciples said, teach us to pray. And then down in verse 11, Jesus says, which of you fathers, if your son asked for a fish to eat, would give him a steak instead? Or if he asked for an egg, would you give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? God delights in answering our requests. Here's the third thing that I think helps make our prayers more radical, and it's cooperation. <clears throat> cooperation. This, to me, is one of the most exciting aspects of prayer. God has, has <laughs> his sovereignly chosen in his plan that we cooperate with his plan by praying and by helping see his word done here on earth. Prayer is God's program. God, in some aspects, has chosen to limit himself, choosing to team with us in prayer. Prayer is the connection he's provided. John chapter 14, Jesus says, Believe me when I say I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. I don't know about you, but that's a tough verse for me to swallow. <clears throat> have you been doing what Jesus has been doing? Let me just remind you of a little bit of what Jesus has been doing. Been raising any of the dead lately? Healed anyone who's sick? 
cast out a demon? I have a hard time with this verse. I, I don't see myself doing those things. And, and there's another verse that says we'll do even greater things. Do you see yourselves doing greater miracles than Jesus? But he says, anyone who believes in me will do what I have been doing and even greater works. How is that possible? And I think the answer is simple. Although hard to apply. And it's prayer. By prayer, when we pray, it can do greater things than when Jesus walked the earth. Because of the presence of his Holy Spirit in us. You say, well, how is this possible? Simple. Prayer is not limited. Prayers are, are not limited by time. Or by space. Limitless in power. See, when Jesus Christ was here on earth, he voluntarily limited himself by becoming a human. By God coming in human form, he said, I can only be at one place at one time, and I can't be in the past, present, future. I can only be at this place. But after his death and resurrection, there came something else. A new connection. Prayers are not limited by time. The prayers of Jesus 2,000 years ago are still being answered today. The prayers I pray today can be answered three weeks from today. They're not limited by time. Prayer is not limited by space. I can pray here for my friend in Southern California, never leaving here. I can pray for my friends uh, on the mission field in Haiti and Guatemala and, and, and wherever. They're not limited by space. Prayers penetrate those places. I don't know about you, but there are so many times when I've woken up in the middle of the night and, 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 and it hasn't been the pee. <laughs> it's been to pray. It's been God saying, wake up, I need you to pray for this. Last summer we were in London. God woke me up in the middle of the night to pray for somebody here at Cornerstone. And as soon as I could get in touch with them, I, 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 I said, hey, God woke me up on this day at about this time. And, and just, I had to pray for you. And he said, that was the day that X, Y, and Z happened in our lives. It felt so good to know that God connected us and God knows where we are and God knows what we need. And so sometimes the radicalness of our prayer to take it to a new level is we need to listen to who God is telling us to pray for. But then we also need to listen to God and say, God is asking me to pray for this thing for me. And God wants to answer it. He wants to give it to us. How's your praying these days? Where can you take it to a new place, a new level? Let's pray. God, we are grateful for your grace, for your help, for your hope, for your love that looks past our sin, that looks past our selfishness, that looks to you alone. God, we ask you today to fill us with a boldness to pray. To pray prayers that would change the world.